You're listening to All Art is Quite Useless, where a group of mates chat about art. We talk about music, literature, films, paintings, and everything in between. The podcast is also brought to you by Cavity Magazine, a magazine dedicated to bringing you the latest developments from the front lines of online writing. Find us on Twitter, at Cavity Magazine, and submit today. Alternatively, you can get in touch by emailing at submissionscavmag at gmail.com. Submissionscavmag at gmail.com. All art is quite useless. week's topic came from myself, Louis, and we are going to discuss inside number nine, the episode titled Deadline. So if you do not wish to be spoiled for this episode, then listen no further as we're going to go in depth. Please enjoy and uh, stay sane. I see y'all lovely, lovely ladies and gentlemen and join me for another episode of Our Lot is Quite Useless. Uh Uh, Tonight we're talking about Inside Number 9, specifically the episode titled Deadline. Deadline. It is the live episode. It aired on October 31st, 2018. And I've put it forward as a point of discussion to my fellow useless art enthusiasts. Uh, once again, I'm joined by Jack Campion, Wagwan, Jamie Powell, hello, and Olivia Loudon. Hello, all. And we are going to discuss Deadline. I don't want to keep forgetting the name of it. I just call it the live one. Don't... Yeah. <laughs> um. So I suggested this because I remember seeing it on my flight to New Zealand two years ago and it's scaring the the bejesus out of myself and I thought, hey, that was smooky. I'm going to suggest to my buddies to watch that because I've never met anyone else that's seen it. I've never really chatted to anyone else about it. And so I thought, here's the perfect platform. So the general synopsis of the episode is that it starts off as a typical live fodder and uh, about seven or eight minutes in, the sound cuts out on a typical episode of Inside Number 9 when you get the technical difficulty slate and then things start to go a bit uh, Charlie Kaufman and self-referential and weird and it's a meta narrative about the studios in which the episode is being filmed in uh, hopefully the listeners at home have watched the episode and hopefully it scared them too i want to know the thoughts and opinions of my nearest and dearest so we'll start with you olivia what did you make of deadline um well i've never seen inside number nine before um so i literally had no expectations other than the fact i thought it was uh, a political show i don't know why i knew, i thought it was a political satire clearly it's not um so yeah and obviously it's such a confusing first episode to watch i don't really know what to make of it and i it's pretty quite much a strange the whole first episode. one definitely yeah i was like oh god how am i gonna speak about this because it's well But then obviously after it aired, I was able to gather my thoughts. But um, yeah, I just spent most of the episode trying to work out where, where it was, what it was trying to do there and where it was taking me. But um, what I, it obviously, like you said, Louis, it is a genuinely really scary episode. And even before anything overtly 
creepy even happened i just remember feeling this sense of dread i think it was just the set design of that opening scene and the the, the characters they feel so whimsical and it it really just gave me the creeps um but yeah it was it was an interesting episode uh jamie what did you make of a deadline so i have seen inside number nine before i've seen kind of a few random episodes here and there um i did start to watch the first few of the first series and from there on out I kind of caught the odd episode here and there with housemates who kind of watched it more regularly than I did. Um, my general kind of thoughts on the show from what I'd seen previously were a bit 50-50. I generally don't like anthology stuff that much because of how much of a gamble you take with each episode in terms of quality. Um, and from what I'd, I had seen of Inside Number 9... It was about 50-50, but that being said, I really enjoyed this episode actually, and I think mainly because of the way it kind of plays with the gimmick of a live episode, and that was something that I was worried about going into it, was that the only kind of other things I could think of that had done live episodes had all been soap operas, like Coronation Street and EastEnders and things like that, and I was worried it was going to be along those lines, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't at all. It really played with the genre, and I suppose... I don't think you know you can count live episodes as a genre in themselves right at the moment because they are kind of more of a, a novelty more than anything else. But the way that it played with that kind of brought up a lot of questions as well. I've got a lot for later in the discussion about what actually was life and what wasn't. And it made me question that in a way that I had n- never really seen done before, which I thought was really, really interesting and I enjoyed about it. There were some parts of it that I thought were quite generally a little bit tropey which I was which confused me because so much of it seemed to be pushing against that but generally yeah I thought it was really really interesting episode excellent and Jackie McCampion uh yeah um I don't know why I'm saying yeah I'm not agreeing to anything uh (laughs) my well my thoughts on the series as a whole I absolutely love it I love Steve Ellington and Reese Shearsmith. Uh, not everything they do, but League of Gentlemen and Inside Number Nine is some of the best TV I've ever seen. Some of the best horror and comedy, and horror comedy comes from those minds, in my opinion. Uh, particularly specific to uh, British sensibilities, but I'd say you know, generally they've added so much to the to the conversation, uh, uh, especially in like Inside Number Nine, where they really play around with narrative styles and get really inventive and creative and weird, um, which is kind of why I left this episode feeling a little bit cold. Because oh really? I, yeah, because I kind of agree with Jamie a little bit because I do think it they do rest on their laurels a little bit with it, and they 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 do go into trope territory, and it's. I think it reaches a certain point where it's so transparently not like, uh, like, well, it is live. It was obviously broadcast live, but it's so transparently you expect you expect it to go in a really, really weird direction, and it just kind of ties itself up in a little knot. Uh, the one things things that I I, don't, I didn't totally dislike the episode. Um, I really liked the accidental broadcasts of old shows particularly uh um most haunted because i have a lot of like nostalgic love for that (laughs) for that show uh boring as it is i do find it very uh entertaining um and i i thought that it was quite fun to play around with um the tv set as as a thing in itself being like the problem and not what's the problems that are created in the program. Um, But yeah, uh, but it kind of reached a point where I just, I'd seen better inside number nine episodes and even though it was live and the, the way they pulled it off is definitely admirable and, the the way they constructed everything is definitely admirable as well. I just didn't think it was a, uh, the strongest from those two, in my opinion. 
Uh, I agree in terms of writing that it's not one of their strongest efforts, but I'm I guess I'm just really willing to overlook that because I think technically it's a really really impressive episode. In that, because when I watched it for the first time, um, in the very start of it, it does look like a live EastEnders episode or whatever. That's like, what I was worried about going and this, in. I was equally worried about it, because like, they never look that... And I, I, li- I listened to an interview with them, the producer and the director on this episode, the BFI, and they said when they were approached by the BBC to do this live episode, they thought, oh, why would we want to do that? That's just going to be like a less good episode of Inside Number 9. Uh, but they warmed to the idea, and... They liked the idea of playing on the fact that people are looking out for it to go wrong. Because that's inherently what you want to do, isn't it? When you're watching something live, there's that risk element that is quite exciting. And yeah, that uh, was, they certainly that was... play with that. Jamie, go, go for it. Sorry, go on. Um, <laughs> that was my favourite part of the episode, was the start when you kind of weren't quite sure what was going on. And almost the bit where they trick you, like... Um... I know Olivia said about the sound um, in that very first bit when it cuts out having to rewind it. I did the same thing only because the speaker we have downstairs occasionally does cut out so I was kind of confused between that (laughs) as well. That is so brilliant to hear by the way because I did the exact same thing on my iPad on the flight and it's one of the things that I remember watching it this time thinking was that if you didn't catch it live how well does some of this stuff translate but it does translate because... That's yeah. two times I've seen it now, and even though I knew it's a fiction that it goes wrong, I still, I, it still kind of got me a bit. I was like, oh yeah, they did a really good job of making it seem like they ballsed it up. <laughs> yeah, my my um, <clears throat> my favorite parts of it were, were also that, especially um, where it's it's almost a candid moment between Steve and Reese in the uh, cha- mm. in the changing rooms. That was mm. I really love I really love that. Uh, I always wish it was just one of those uh, when they do their condensed ones where they, it takes place all in one room and it was just the changing rooms, the, the, the downtime between uh, rehearsals or something. I think they've already done an episode quite similar to that in concept. If I'm not mistaken, I, I haven't seen all the episodes of been something done, but I seem to recall there being one in the first or second series where it all takes place in a dressing room. Well, there's the, and it's um, kind of that setup. There's the there's the karaoke episode as well, isn't there? That all basically takes place in one room. There's a few of them, but I think that they I mm. think they really work, uh, and they really work. Uh, that would have really worked with the meta aspect of it, and uh, also the live interaction as well. Maybe. Yeah, that's that's one of the really one of the other really interesting things that I never picked up on the first time and doing a bit of research is that that scene where it cuts to them in the in the changing room dressing room rather uh reese actually goes on twitter live yeah and reads out tweets that were happening Hmm. oh Um, really yeah and he actually sent a tweet out during Mm. that moment because i always thought after the slate goes up and the episode is cut and then it's kind of revealed that it's meant to go wrong yeah i just assumed all the the first time i saw it i assumed that it's not live after that part I always just thought the only the very first bit is live, but even that was yeah. pretty pre-recorded. I didn't actually buy into much of it being live because it's so well choreographed in some of its moments. Yeah, and was so cynical as well to just be like to just think, um, oh, okay, the conceit is up, and now it's all going to progress yeah. in a certain direction. Sorry, Liv, you're going to say something. I think. Well, no, I think that's why I was so confused, and I completely forgot it was live because it was so impressive what they'd. The way they'd spliced the videos together and incorporated all these different elements and made it so meta, you would just never ever think that they could have done that live, and that's why it's mm. all the more impressive. Mm. Yeah, but, um, like all I'm the guess- stuff of Reese Shearsmith running around with the GoPro on his head, like that is—he was genuinely filming those segments. I know. Um, uh, yeah, is that the the last scene, obviously, where he gets pushed off the the stairs? Mm. Yes, I think so. Although I think that bit was yeah. actually pre-recorded. Oh, okay. It probably would have been. Uh, I think. I think they said in that interview about sixty nine percent of it is live. Yeah. Okay. And like thirty percent, thirty one percent is like the live is the is the archive footage and a little bit of pre recording. 
But even things as far as the music were played live for that episode. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's mad. But that's that's what's interesting is that it makes you question it. As soon as they start to play with it and you realise that they're kind of messing with the format and with the genre, you start looking at everything in a different way. Or at least I was when I was thinking about the episode. I was thinking, well, which parts have they recorded live? Because obviously the stock footage and um, the old stuff of Most Haunted is clearly not live. The Bobby Davro. Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's... Yeah, yeah that's Bobby, a, the oh. famous Bobby Davro clip. It's brilliant. <laughs> I was laughing that was like so the, much. the opportunity the for them to change sets or work around things in live. So I was like, oh, okay, so they must be using that for a reason other than, like, you know, contextually it being like... Yeah. Like, hauntings and horror there's a reason that this footage is being used so that logistically when they're doing it live they can switch around but even watching yeah like the head cam footage i was questioning all that kind of stuff which yeah it made me watch the episode in a different way from there on out which i i was enjoying a lot more than it just being live and me knowing that it was live mm. one of the things live that i want to ask you about seeing as this was your very first episode of inside number nine was yeah. Was it weird when they played around with what Inside Number Nine is? For example, when they cut back to the dressing room, and he's like reading the tweets, and he's like, "Oh, what is this? One of your plots? Ha ha ha!" and everything. And yeah. they actually show the, the 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 fake standby programming for that night is an old episode of Inside Number Nine. Hmm. But I guess you, yeah. I guess because you, that, that, that's like one of their most famous episodes is that one that they start showing. But then they digitally alter the images so that you start seeing the ghosts and stuff in it. <laughs> Honestly, that, that all completely went over my head. I, I got what they were trying to do, but it really had no contextual reference for me. And I almost feel a bit misled, Louis, because you were like, oh, yeah, you don't need to have seen any inside number nine because they're all like, um, individual episodes <laughs> and then i was watching it and i was like great so many references to past yeah, episodes this is probably <laughs> the only episode where that is the case yeah you could have done yeah. with a bit more context i think you lied to us louis i lied to you i'm not allowed to pick things anymore this <laughs> no. is my one shot and i've already blown it you had one <laughs> this is my last one appearance job. on all that it's quite useless <laughs> goodbye <laughs> you have been eliminated um, jack Yes. I'm I'm quite interested to find out which parts did you think were, were tropey? Because I'm interested to see if mm. you thought the same parts as me. Well, there's the fake jump scare, which is obviously foreshadowing the real jump scare at the beginning. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, in the middle. Um, there was... I which one's that? Oh, the it, fake one? Yeah, there's the fake out where he puts on the mask and he jumps out of the head cam. Oh, yeah, yeah. Before, right before he gets electrocuted. Um, then there's like... The technical difficulties thing, even though I did like it, was very. It was quite. That was quite trippy. I don't know. Uh, then, oh, what else is there? I think the... it was tropey, but I feel like they. Uh, in horror things, technical difficulties often is, but I feel like they did a pretty good job of doing that trope. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. One aspect of it that I actually appreciated, which is, was a subversion of the trope, which I found really funny. Which is where um, they're in the changing rooms, and uh, I think Steve says to Reese, "Like, oh, can you check? Uh, can you check Twitter?" And he's like, "Can't. I've not got any signal." And he says, "Yeah, you have. You've got Wi-Fi." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, I love that because one of my most hated uh, tropes in modern horror films is when a character can't get any Wi-Fi or signal for some reason. It's yeah. Like, Obviously, you would at Granada Studios in central London. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... actually in Manchester, Granada. Well, wasn't this before it moved? I think it's set in Manchester. Uh, I think the Granada Studio, the abandoned Granada Studios is in Manchester. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I thought it was all. Oh, my, my mistake. Right. Well, <laughs> That's now it's my turn to be banned from the podcast. <laughs> I'm going to tell the podcast Louis Epic Jack. Fans, Jack. <laughs> with facts and logic I have a question for you Jack yes um, obviously you're quite a uh, big horror movie fan I am um, yeah did you what did you find any bits genuinely scary or if not why or if yes why well 
Uh, that's, good, that's a good question. I like the um, quaintness of the, of the horror in this. Um, in terms of using the old episode of Most Haunted to craft the narrative. Um, and yeah. the, uh, <laughs> which I actually found more effective than the uh, uh, horror horror moments like the uh, all the lights going off the old lady acting weird yeah um, yeah i didn't find it just seemed a bit schlocky do you know what i mean uh, yeah and, uh, those 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 were the bits when i was saying about it being tropey i was thinking of those moments particularly like when they start going on about you shouldn't be here yeah and yeah this being some kind of haunted area that was the bits that i was thinking of as being a bit like oh okay i probably didn't need this like yeah it, it seems it's, it's... For, for an episode that was making me question a lot more that was telling me something and i didn't want it to in a way yeah they do these they do that sort of thing quite a lot on league of gentlemen where they'll they'll play to a horror trope and know they're doing it but they're making a lot of jokes while doing it so yeah. you don't you're not like oh it's scary because you're too busy laughing which yes. is probably why this episode yes. if the, one of my biggest critiques of it is that it's not a particularly funny episode there are a couple of jokes in it but they're focused more on pulling off this stunt than than making yeah. a funny yeah. comedy yeah. thing yeah. which you know fair enough they don't always have to be pigeonholed into doing one certain thing but i think in those moments yeah. uh, it would have helped cover up some of the less good horror bits mm. Mm. i i yeah i agree but i uh, yeah live to answer your question I, I didn't really it didn't really work as a particularly like original horror or anything it didn't really seem to be doing anything yeah. new other than using our archive footage and doing it live yeah i think um the bits I found the scariest was the beginning, like like I said, the first five minutes. I was so like unsettled. Oh yeah, without, I wanted to ask you about like the that. first ten minutes. Yeah. Um. So was it specifically the um the story within the story was uh, and that set was that giving you the creeps? Yeah, just like the whole when he like had this phone. And it's just the feeling of absolute dread, like when you know that something's not right, but you don't know what, and it's so nightmarish. Like he was obviously, the character was trying to work out in his head, like something's amiss here. And then you have this really creepy vicar that came in and like the the, the sound cutting out. I found that section a lot more affecting this time than the first time I watched it. That That was the most, and then it almost... It almost seemed to lose itself towards the end when it it sort of played on i was like there was points in it and when i was like right so i'm i'm waiting for a jump scare to happen and i don't like those sorts of horrors it is a bit yeah. it does turn to that bit doesn't it yeah it does a little bit it, it comes kind of becomes a haunted house right at the end yeah um, <laughs> interesting side note don't know if any of you noticed it but uh did you notice the wallpaper on the inside of the changing rooms of the dressing room no no, I see, I see uh, Overlook Hotel. Oh, was pattern. it? Oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't even notice yeah. that. That was a nice little, nice little touch, but <laughs> doesn't. Um, yeah. One of the things I really enjoyed in the episode, which reminded me of it follows strangely, is that you do spend a lot Ooh. of the episode scanning the screen looking for the ghosts, which yeah. I found pretty entertaining. Yeah, mm. a, I Definitely. think that's quite a tough trick to pull off. Yeah, I liked I that. I liked seeing the glimpses of, of like, you know, footsteps and, and stuff like that, and or a shadow. I, I find that quite well, interesting. My favourite one being the one where they're playing the old episode of Inside Number 9, and because because I'm, I've seen that episode like three or four times, I suppose, because, like I said, it's one of their sort of really famous ones. Um, I had kind of got sucked into the episode, like, oh yeah, it is quite good, isn't it? And, like, you get... Especially because the moment where the horror <laughs> element is introduced is when they're doing the comedy stuff. And so you're like, ah, Reese and Steve are doing funny stuff. And then all of a sudden you see that face in the distance. You're like, oh, oh. And then the motion sensor light comes Ooh, on again yeah, and it's yeah, like yeah. banging on the window. I was like, oh, that really freaked me out, actually. That got me. Yeah. Yeah. So I do appreciate the those those technical aspects and the dedication to detail with the ghosts and stuff in the background. I, that's always fun. It's always fun to like pick scenes apart and see what's you know in the uh, in the background. I think that when creators do that, it's 
it it just shows an extra level of care and um like as though you you assume that people will go back and watch what you've made and pick out more than the first time around i i do like i do like that aspect to it yeah it's one of the things that they said in the uh, in that interview was be- because it fooled so many people as it went out they said 20% of the audience tuned out about seven minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. This was something that I was I was interested to ask about. So did this go out... It, was it a Halloween special then? I, I believe so. Oh, okay. So th- th- that like says to me that there was probably a lot of viewers watching who kind of tuned in because mm-hmm. it was an event episode and who weren't regular Inside Number 9 viewers and probably weren't... Um, not aware of, but like you know, attuned to the fact that they play with yeah. narratives in that way. Yes. So I think it's really, really that's a really interesting risk to take, particularly knowing that it was going to be this one-off special that you'd get a lot of new viewership from to take something that was so unconventional and also something that potentially you could risk losing people quite easily, particularly people who weren't familiar yeah. with it. Like you can imagine the the goggle box crowd <laughs> tuning in and, and being exactly absolutely yeah. baffled. Um, mm-hmm. which would be great TV viewing. <laughs> uh, they've done it before, though, where they had event episodes. Uh, Louis, I don't suppose you remember the, um, the, the, the hype that was around the Krampus episode, do you? No, I, I've never seen that one. No. You've never seen that one? Much like oh Jamie, I've, I, because well, the show uh, is quite 50-50 in terms of its writing quality, as most anthology shows are, mm. I've usually let the people whose opinions I really rate, I usually let them sift through it all and then, then let them tell me which <laughs> ones are worth going back to. <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen, I think I've seen all of them except the latest mm-hmm. series, which I will probably make my way through at some point in the near future. But the Krampus episode uh, is phenomenal, in my opinion. It's, um, I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, it's it it kind of plays around with its meta narrative in a similar way to this one, but because it's not live, I suppose they had more freedom to go a bit weirder. They went a bit more, um, well, a bit. They went a bit more subtle, and um, they it, it's it's very very subversive and very freaky, uh, and it's filmed in um, it's filmed on actual 35 millimeter film oh, I think. Cool. Uh, and it's and it's a uh, 16 by 9 ratio i think so it's like oh, old I, might, school. I might check that one out this evening then yeah it's it's uh, it's it's really nice viewing actually um will it will make you a little bit depressed i think in the end <laughs> yeah um one of the original ideas they had when uh they wanted it to cut to their standby footage in the episode, they wanted it to cut to Mrs. Brown's boys. Yeah, I, re- and I then, saw like, that. <laughs> they wanted to get the guys from Mrs. Brown's boys to be up for it, so that like when Mrs. Brown opens up the door, a ghost just like launches a machete into her head, <laughs> which would have been amazing. <laughs> yeah, which would have been brilliant. But, uh, um, they never quite did that. Oh my god, I so. I so wish they did that. that I think that would have made the yeah, episode that would have been 10 brilliant, out of 10, to be honest. Especially, yeah, especially if so it was like a, that event episode and they got more viewers than normal. And it's like, oh, well, at least we got Mrs. Brown's voice and then scaring the <laughs> shit out of the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> would have been so good. All the Gogglebox viewers would have been shook. <laughs> that would have been genuinely amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't don't know what the crossover is between Mrs. Brown's Boys viewers and Inside Number Nine. Yeah, nine probably viewers. not. Probably not huge. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> not the actual high. standby footage for if they actually balls up their live performance of it was uh, a Quiet Night in that that episode that they spoofed. Yes, he would have got that anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought it was quite interesting that you were saying there about them kind of joking about their probably being a new audience for this episode, as it being an event episode, and there not being much overlap when is it Moira the name of the character gets the call mm-hmm. in the episode and says about oh I hadn't heard of the show yeah apparently it's this <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no. dark comedy sketch show was... I thought that was a really cool way to address yeah, it yeah that, that line that yeah. Rishi Smith has when she's doing her spiel about 
Like they're in the technology, it makes them strong. It's like, no, Stephanie, that's Black Mirror. No, that's Black Mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was great. That's and all the stuff that I really liked. That got a big laugh out of me. That did. All the, um, yeah, all the all the commentary on it from the creators themselves. Uh, I I absolutely loved. I thought it was, fun. and it it's nice when you've been following uh, the careers of these two for as long as you have, and uh, you've also been watching Inside Number Nine for such a long time. It's it's nice to hear them acknowledge it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like a little fandom, little nerd fandom thing. Yeah. other episodes is there enough meat to these bones that you'd pursue yeah i think i did try to watch an episode uh a few years ago because uh i know liam was like obsessed with inside number nine Mm -hmm. and friend of the show friend of the show hello liam if you're listening yeah 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 liam he's a, a mutual friend of ours um yeah so i tried to watch it then and i don't know i just i don't know i think i'm I have to be in a good, like, the right mood to watch these sort of things. And clearly I wasn't. But I think after that, I do want to give it a watch again. Um, but I do have to say, that episode, it's probably the most... It's probably the most successful experimental TV I've seen. And the only other recent comparison I can think of is Bandersnatch, which and I think this was executed much better than Bandersnatch was in terms well, of... Well, I've still not done that. You are? I've still never done the Bandersnatch. I keep meaning to do that uh... at some point. It, it's not that good, to be honest. I liked it. I've heard, I've heard broadly positive things, but then that's the same with Black Mirror, isn't it? Some people love it, some yeah. people don't. Like every episode is like really? that. Really? I think I was. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I really liked. Uh, I'm gonna sound like a bit of a pretentious twat, but I really like the aesthetic of it, and like <laughs> we're yeah. literally recording a podcast right now about our love of art. I think we, I think it's too yeah, late to sound like a pretentious <laughs> twat. This is true. Um, no, I just I, I, basically I was I was a bit pandered to on a surface level with how everything looked and how it was um sort of retro uh, video game style like uh, yeah uh, uh, the text based adventure type thing because um, I really like like video game history and uh, that era of mm. that, that yeah. era of experimentation with technology and stuff I really enjoyed and and. Um, also, I really like the poem, the Jabberwocky. <laughs> oh, it's sick, isn't it? It's really good. <laughs> yeah. So the Bandersnatch, I get to think about the Jabberwocky whilst playing this interactive game. So <laughs> what's not to love? Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. So that's right. I, well, I thought like the key difference, like, because I personally didn't enjoy Bandersnatch that much. And I think the key difference between Bandersnatch and this episode of Inside Number 9 was that the like core conceit of Bandersnatch is as it presents itself like you go into it knowing it's this interactive episode mm. that you're going to be able to engage with in some way whereas with the Inside Number 9 episode it's much more like as you're watching it there's more exploration if that doesn't sound too wanky <laughs> but <laughs> don't worry about it you know what I mean like this it, it, it kind of yeah. as, as as you're watching the episode there's more surprise there and there was more and mm. I found that personally more engaging than with something like Bandersnatch, which is kind of the gimmick that I was worried that the live episode was going to be. Well, Bandersnatch, you have to acknowledge the the conceit, don't you? Yeah, that's mm. that's what I think. I kind of appreciate... I feel similarly about both of the episodes. I kind of appreciate what they were trying to do and their contribution to, you know, bringing this you know for just trying something new and pushing the boundaries of tv more than i actually enjoyed the process of it happening like i really i think that episode of inside number nine was so impressive in terms of how they pulled it off and how they pushed the boundaries of the art of tv and the same with bandersnatch like i respect them for trying to do what they did but do i did i enjoy it more than i'd enjoy a regular episode probably not 
Yeah, it's funny you say that because a lot of the best episodes of Inside Number Nine have left me impressed afterwards, thinking, how did they do that? That's that's so impressive. <laughs> mm. There's one in, I think it's the third or fourth series called Once Removed, which is that chronologically you see the last thing that happens in the episode in the first scene, and then it keeps going back five minutes and five minutes before. So you keep getting more context for what the last thing you saw was. Oh, yeah. uh, and I remember watching that for the first time also with Liam, friend of the show, when he showed that one to me. I remember <laughs> being like baffled at the end of it, like, how did they write that? That is so impressive. Yes, yeah, I completely agree. It's phenomenal. Yeah, and like the the, yeah. the, the final reveal in that episode seems like such a mundane little thing, but it, it it adds so much more context to everything you saw before it. But, but chronologically happens after it. It's so yeah, so impressive. As someone, as someone that likes writing, I thought, I don't know how I'd begin to do that. Begin to write something <laughs> like that. It's kind of begging to be deconstructed, isn't it? Mm. Um, I, I, um, that's what I love about Inside Number Nine is there is, there's an episode for everyone, I think. Because um, the first, I think the first two series are far more horror focused or horror comedy focused than the later two series uh which have a lot more emotional variety i think but um even so there's like there is a there's a million different genres between the notes like there there's a lot of playing around with stuff and that's why i think that if live if you were to go back and watch the whole of it you would actually come out far more positive than you would based on this episode yeah yeah i agree well, I think that's probably likely, yeah. Yeah. It's like Doctor Who, really. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. but that's, the, that's the format with anthology shows, though, isn't it? Is that you, t- you yeah, take the which good, you take, almost yeah, is. You take the good with the bad. Like, from a writing and acting perspective, it's probably so exciting to work on because mm. you, it's limitless options. You can keep your show going for as long as you fancy doing it. Uh, and never having mm. to feel like you have to resolve an overall arc when you've got a new arc every week and you can get it done in half an hour. Yeah. yeah, and they can choose how much they kind of want to show you in each individual one as well. Like, I, I thought it was interesting there, Louis, that you were saying about the fact that in the other episode that you watched, the amount of context it lent to it kind of improved mm-hmm. the episode. Whereas I thought it was almost the opposite with this much. Like when I was saying about some of the trophy things, I thought they were kind of giving us too much context. The bits that I found really creepy were, like I said at the start, when you weren't really sure what was going on, whether it was yeah. an accident or whether they were actually having te- technical difficulties or not. Yeah. And then also, at one point, when they cut back to the fictional episode and you kind of re enter yeah, it midway that bit's through great. with him killing the guy in the bath. That, without any context, I I mean, I don't know because we'll never see the full thing, but I feel like it was much creepier and much more unnerving just cutting cold straight back to that and seeing that, just that, that image, There's a really. shot where mm. she's entered his house and he's coming out of the bathroom and it just keeps zooming in on her face. And I, I just, I don't know why, it really freaked me out. I guess because, like I said about the whole scanning the screen to see if there were any ghosts, she stood in front of this frosted glass door and I kept thinking, what if there's a figure behind her? And they do eventually do that reveal where, like, Mm -hmm. as it zooms out and you see Steve Pemberton and uh, this lady leave the shop, you see this figure in the background you're like, oh, I was right the whole time. But, like, in a satisfying way, not Mm -hmm. in, like, an annoying trophy way. At least that's how I thought about it. Uh, I was convinced that uh, the uh, uh, Moira character was in some way related to the evil presence in the studio um, because of how uh, that uh, the 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 show within the show was constructed. You know, yeah, I think yeah. that's what like the 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 fake inverted comments episode of it was suggesting, but that was different to what the actual episode was i mean yeah it's confusing to talk about like narratively where that ties into the overarching thing and if you can actually separate the two but um yeah i know what you're saying jack it's it's weird isn't it It, yeah it is weird and uh maybe maybe i was expecting some 
something else from the show when I was watching. I was trying to. I think it was a case of, um, you know, when you you kind of second guess everything that you're being presented with, and uh, it's like when you're being given given a riddle and you try and make these really uh, abstract connections and these uh, really like overly complex uh, systems of um, problem solving when in fact the, the answer is right in front of you and it's actually not as complicated as you're making it out to be. Felt like that's how I was treating the show a little bit the first time I was watching it because the, 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 the quote fake show is, it, uh, it felt like that was trying to tell me something and I I don't think it was, other other than yeah. just to be a counterpoint and a conceit for the actual meta narrative, which is the actual narrative. Do you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a bit of a word. <laughs> bit, bit, bit of a word sound. <laughs> Upon doing some of my research for this discussion, I came across a lot of references to another live Halloween special that aired in 1992 called Ghost Watch. Right. I'd never heard of it before this, but a lot of the articles that I'd read, or the reviews rather, of uh, Deadline keep referencing this special on the BBC called Ghost Watch. And... Uh, <laughs> I need to watch this. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll quote from this Guardian <laughs> article quick. that Despite its reputation as a TV landmark, the notorious Ghost Watch was only ever shown once in the UK on 31st October 1992. Such was, <laughs> such was the fervour surrounding this unforgettable drama about a TV investigation into poltergeist activity in suburbia, the BBC banned any repeats. So I think, so I think that uh, they based some of the ideas... Not entirely, because I think they, they poo-pooed some of it in that live uh, interview that I saw with them, but uh, it sounds like it does share a lot of the same ideas that we're going to trick the audience and this live special to freak them all out for Halloween. And I want to try and watch it now. It's, it's uh, yeah, perked my interest. I'm intrigued. I, yeah, I've just got the Wikipedia yeah. up. It looks amazing. Yeah, that, might, oh, be, uh, that might be worth a watch sometime. I... I I have shown mm. Yeah. Um that it kinda makes me yearn for more weird creepy shit that's just on normal TV. It gave me faith that T V is still a thing that can be fun yeah. and exciting in a way yeah. the streaming platforms aren't. Like T V does not does not make it the use of like experimental art, I think, nearly as much as film does. It it's you know, T V I think is very commercial and I, I, as I was watching, I was thinking, I literally never watch art, artistically valuable TV. Well, obviously you do in a sense of, you know, if you watch a good TV show, it has artistic value, but never experimental. Um, and I do want to watch more of that. Yeah. Are we drawing a line between what's on terrestrial television and what's on streaming networks? Because I don't really consider streaming I suppose. TV. I guess, like, do you know what it's I mean? a TV show that you can see on streaming, but... I know what you mean. Yeah. But shows made for streaming, like like we were talking before the podcast started, like The Tiger yeah. King, which is a series of one hour documentaries that form a whole narrative. Like it's kind of constructed in in a TV show way, but it's not what you would expect to see on like I don't know, maybe you'd see it on channel five or something, mm. but it'd be made way more <laughs> way schlockier and with, yeah. like, no production. It's, it's yeah. funny that you say like the, the one hour continuing narrative way is, is like you were saying constructed as if it is on TV but then like Inside Number 9 which is on terrestrial television it's not like that at all like they're all half hour self-contained episodes so it's 
Yeah, I think that's just yeah. British. That's British TV, though. Do you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't get that from a platform like Netflix. I don't think. What you wouldn't get inside? No, the I feel. I feel like it's such like Brit- British television. Well, what What about it? Do you think is so British? I don't know. I think it's just the every everything about it. It's just I, you know I can't really put my finger on it. That's well. That's no, but I think I know what you're talking about because what I was pointing to the when I was talking about like the quaintness. Yeah, of the horror, it's very Shaun um, of the Dead, isn't it? Well, I mean, it starts. Like the fake TV show is is an old man who finds a phone in a graveyard and talks to an old woman who goes to church, and the vicar who's got like a cycling helmet on and <laughs> looks a bit ridiculous, and everyone everyone's a bit yeah everyone's a, a little bit um, yeah odd, and then they're just they're just in Granada TV studios, which is where they film. Is it EastEnders? They film Corrie. Like, Coronation Street, I think. Coronation Street. This, they film like Corrie there, which is like. It's a British soap opera that is very, spe- very, very specifically. They especially showing the clip British of Bobby Dabro um, falling on his face as well. That the, is so British. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. When they when they all started doing that dance, and I was like, "Oh my god!" TV was really like the TV is kind of like this still. Like I was just watching. Um, I caught a bit of Anton Dex Saturday Night oh Takeaway. God. Whilst I was having my dinner before <laughs> this, and there was a, a montage of like a load of boy and boy bands and girl bands singing their one hit wonders, and then Ant and Deck came on and sang "Let's Get Ready to Rumble," oh, which, is their, bi- which is their biker growth Tune. single. Oh and I was like, "This is ridiculous and quite crap," but also I'm having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> You know I mean? I'd, I'd never watched an episode of Ant and Dex Saturday Night Takeaway until like two weeks ago and when I watched it I was like this is honestly the worst thing I've ever seen but it's so watchable yeah I know what you mean <laughs> Liv and Jamie it's a little bit like when we went to that holiday camp in Newquay and yes. the in-house yeah. entertainment that was at that holiday camp <laughs> well, like you know, it's the cringiest, worst thing ever. But also, it's so much fun. Yeah, and you everyone's can't having a good time, it, smiling the whole way through it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't deny that my heart is warm. It's the televisual equivalent of sticking uh, Bohemian Rhapsody on it at the end of the night. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I kind of I, in, in terms of it being a quintessentially British show, I think that's really where what it comes down to if i've if i've if i've pushed towards a certain quality that is inherent in that kind of uh tv i mean inside number nine has its roots in uh classic horror but it also has its roots in classic comedy Mm. and sketch Mm. comedy which is famously british um i also absolutely agree with you Liv, that you were saying that it's not the kind of thing that you would ever see on a streaming platform, mainly because like live episodes aren't really a thing on streaming platforms. Like this is something that's so specific to mm-hmm. event TV. Yeah. And when people do specials, and the fact that it plays with that in that way is it's such an interesting um, take on it. And I, I I do kind of wish I had experienced it live because I think it would have been the kind of Im- impressions and the. Um, the satisfaction you get from it playing with those tropes would have been tenfold if if it, if you'd been there experiencing yeah, it first hand. I, I definitely agree, especially because in the such extreme lengths to try and prove to you that it's still live, which I never, like I said, I never picked up on the first time I saw mm. it. But this time, when because I, I, like I said, the first time I just thought after the slate saying technical difficulties goes up, I thought that's it. Like it's not live anymore, but when it cuts to them in that room and he starts reading out tweets, and I had to look up afterwards that they are actual tweets from that time. And then he put out a tweet saying, "Are me and Steve on BBC Two right now?" And he puts on BBC News at ten at one point, which wow. would have been airing on BBC One alongside them performing, and it was the actual news. Like, and so like they, they keep having to prove to you. That it's yeah. still alive, which oh yeah, it's 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 very clever the way they did it all. I take my hat. I would love, 
yeah, <laughs> me too. I would love them to do another live thing. But yeah, they're so creative, especially with uh, any sort of creative or technical limitation. They they always they they seem to constantly pull rabbits yeah. out of hats in that way. That's what uh, that's what baffles me every time I watch an episode of Inside Number Nine, and it's just like they must have literally racked their brains for weeks. I I'm surprised they've never really been poached by like Hollywood at all. I've never really heard of the, either one of them doing particularly uh higher than bbc comedy stuff particularly not that i'm saying you know it's a good level to be at because they still got complete creative control and can dictate how they do it but Mm. we don't know if they're we don't know if they're getting offers or not i mean think about uh black mirror and charlie brooker yeah uh they Netflix adopted Black Mirror and they gave mm. us one of the best seasons followed by one of the worst seasons and how much of that was Charlie Brooker influenced like I, I have no idea um, I certainly don't think that Netflix would turn down Inside Number 9 but I also don't think that I think the Inside Number 9 is still a bit still a bit too cool to Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd like to know what it's actual uh well, I, I guess I can look into it, but I'd love to know how popular cause they, their stuff's been on Netflix for years. Yeah, they have. And mm-hmm. I can imagine it catching on well with a Netflix audience because anthology is in, and people on Netflix will just watch anything the, as long as it's on the top <laughs> yeah. of the banner. And it often is. It often is near the more higher viewed stuff. But I guess Netflix don't often share their numbers, do they? But... It's a it's a weird mindset. Well, they do they do, they do bird box. <laughs> Just to make trick you into watching Bird Box. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird <laughs> mindset that people have though. Um, that I think we all have to some extent, which is like people will just watch something to to completion, even if they're not particularly enjoying it. Like at work, the amount of people who would come in and talk about the whatever was at the top of the banner that week on Netflix, and they have like overwhelmingly yeah. negative opinions of it but then they watch the whole thing they watch the whole yeah it was the same at my work as well actually they come in and say what crap movie they watched on netflix last yeah. night but then they won't take a punt on like a korean film because it's got subtitles yeah, <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> maybe that's what they were banking on in this episode and that people would kind of just stick it out regardless which i don't know maybe it didn't work out presuming that louis you mentioned about the figure for viewership dropping off after that first kind of fake technical well, issue. Well, in a way, though, twenty a fifth of your audience jumping off the cliff is actually kind of a huge indication that you've done such a good job in making it look like yeah, you faking pulled it, it yeah. yeah. That it tricked mm-hmm. a fifth of its audience. That's what I thought, yeah. And I think a fifth is sort of the, like the golden middle ground. It's not too much where it's not worth it to make it, but it's enough to know that you've done a good job in what you were trying to do, like... It is like that, ha- that, that happy medium. Yeah, I think as well, um, they were banking on if people... They must have obviously thought people will drop out if we've tricked them too well. But then it makes it yeah. more exciting for the people that did stay. And then, it, and then like, like, you know, like we've said all, all night, is that it became an event, and then people would have been talking about it, much like we are here, like, a year and a half later. Mm. But, um, so, yeah, I, I think... You're definitely right for some of its more plot-based, uh, irritable moments. Not, they're not, well, they, I didn't find them particularly irritating, because I was just still... I think the conceit of the live thing that they pulled off is impressive enough that I'll overlook the, the blemishes. Yeah. But uh, I just think it needs to be shouted from the hilltops what an incredible job they did technically, for this and, and the director. Uh, did as well because that must have been yeah. some difficult to I don't want do. Yeah, no, I I, I don't want to give the impression that I don't like respect it, and I definitely want more things to do, more to try more challenging stuff like they've done. Um, but yeah, just I I was just left a little bit cold, and it, it was. It was made worse by the fact that I genuinely love everything that they do, yeah. to a certain extent. So, yeah, um, that's really that. I I would probably watch it again, but 
I probably wouldn't be in a rush to see it again. I am in a rush, however, to watch uh, Ghost Adventures. <laughs> <laughs> um, most haunted. Uh, most haunted. Uh, Liv, if you like this, I highly recommend oh, the first yes. series they did, League of League of Gentlemen. It is. Uh, it is honestly. Oh, God, I think yeah. it's so up your alley in terms of its bizarre macabre humor. Really. It's it's like yeah, a sketch show where actually. the conceit okay. of that one is that it all takes place in the fictional village of Royston Vasey, and they then or those two, Mark and Mark Gattis play every person in the village. Oh my god! <laughs> and it's absolutely brilliant. It is like disgusting at points, uh, but yeah, it's, it's so bitterly vile. funny. <laughs> it's, it's so good. I might check that out before I check out Inside Number Nine. Not not as addictive to mm. that program, but just because it's been personally recommended. I think it might endear you more to Inside Number Nine once you spend some time with them. Yeah, I reckon so as well. Yeah. So I feel like League of Gentlemen is such a good way to get to know what their comedy is. Yeah. And yeah. then that opens up the rest of their stuff. Even Psychoville is probably their least successful show, but there are some really good moments in that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. listening to this episode of the Cavity Mouth Podcast on Inside Number 9. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on this special live episode of the show. Next week we'll be discussing the album Another Green World by Brian Eno, so please tune in to hear all of our opinions on that. Thanks again to Cavity Mag for having me. You can find them on Twitter at Cavity Magazine and Instagram, Cavity underscore Mag. They post short stories, essays and much more, so if you have any work you'd like to get published, simply send it across to submissions, cavmag at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Until next time.